Oh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the India panel of the Asia Business Conference. My name is Anil, Anil Karnani. I'm a faculty here at the Ross School of Business. I've been here a long time, 40 years now. And what I do is teach courses on business strategy. Uh, and my primary qualification for being the moderator for this India panel is that I was born in India and speak Hindi very badly. And that's about it, Tim. But we have three very talented speakers in this panel. What I'm gonna do now is introduce the three speakers very briefly, just a couple of sentences about each, tell you a little bit about how the session is gonna proceed, and then we'll have the speakers talk. <clears throat> so after my brief introduction, I'll ask each of the speakers to talk for about five to 10 minutes each. Then the four of us, the three panel speakers and I, we'll have a pretty free form discussion for about 20, 30 minutes. And then we'll open it up to a Q and A session with all the audience and for another about 30 minutes or so. So that'll probably get us to about 11 o'clock, the end of the session. But if we have some time, we can leave a few minutes for open networking among all the audience and the participants and the panel speakers too. Here. So the three speakers for today are, the first one is Varun Sridhar, and uh, Varun is in Goa, the right place to be these days. And he leads PTM Money, which is the biggest digital wealth management platform in India today. Varun has had much experience as an executive and as an entrepreneur, both in the traditional financial sector, as well as in the new FinTech industry coming up here. Dilip is the managing director of Manipal Health Enterprises, which is an integrated hospital system with several hospitals in India and abroad with over 6,000 beds. He has had much experience in finance and strategy and as a top executive in the healthcare sector. Upasna Konidella is the next generation entrepreneur from the Apollo Hospital family group. And she believes very strongly in socialistic sustainable businesses and that business should have a meaningful impact on society and give back to society. By the way, Upasana, the business school here is very big on what we call positive business, which is very similarly aligned to what you say. That's amazing. Yeah. And Upasana started an organization called Your Life that focuses on improving the productivity and well being of the Indian workforce here. Yeah. And she can talk more about it. Now, you notice there are some common elements among the three speakers. They're all, of course, from India, but they have tremendous experience both as executives and as entrepreneurs in their respective organizations. They're primarily from two sectors, finance and healthcare. And our session will focus somewhat more on those two sectors too. The other common element I see is that they all span from sort of the old traditional way of doing business as well as the new digital world that we are all entering. So we'll talk about how is their sector organization in India managing these traditional way of doing business and the new digital world. I also see another common element is that all three of them have experience on the ground level with an action orientation and leading an organization, but they also see the big picture from high up there. So what's the vision for the organization, the sector for India, that it's not just a ground level issue, but a high level issue too. And I think we should structure the session like that. So I see us in this session talking at three levels. One is at the level of the Indian economy and the business sector. So where is the Indian economy going? What's happening to the private business in India? What do future prospects look like? What policies and strategies are working? What's not working? Then we could talk about the two major sectors, healthcare and finance, which are critical obviously in India as well as in any other country. And what's happening in these two sectors? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What trends are taking place? And then in the three organizations that our three speakers lead and what's happening in their organization. What challenges do you face? What are the strategic issues? What do you plan to do? Where do you see success coming from? To get us started, let me make a few comments about India, which I see from sort of far away, but 
the three of you can talk more about what you see happening in India and then talk about the sector and the, your business too. What I see happening in India from sort of further away, so to say, is that the Indian economy was already slowing down before the pandemic. Yeah. Growth had come down in India from 7% or so that was in the prior years to 4% in the year 2019, 2020. And in the current year, it's likely to decelerate much further. I think I saw estimates that the Indian economy might contract as much as nine, 10%, which is more than many of the other major economies. And the World Bank sees very slow recovery in India, probably slower than many other countries. So I'd like to learn more about what do you see as the prospects for the Indian economy? Are the government policies on the right track or not? If not, what would you advocate? How is the Indian business community managing this? What can they do to accelerate growth faster in India? Then another major issue in India that I see, which especially follows on what Upasana does too, is that even before the pandemic, about half the population in India was precariously close to the poverty line, either below the poverty line or only slightly above the poverty line. That's a pretty large fraction. Half the population in India was precariously close to being poor. And the pandemic in India, as well as in the US or the whole world, has widened this inequality gap between the affluent and the not affluent. And that's true in India too that more people are now falling below the poverty line than before the pandemic. And what should the Indian government and the Indian business community and the Indian civil society be doing to bring up the well-being not only of the affluent, educated, organized industrial sector in India, but the unorganized, less educated, informal workers in India too. Yeah. So where do you see India and inequality going, and then talk a little bit about the sector that you are in and the organization that you lead here. Yeah. When we go in this order, let's have Varun go first, and then Dilip, and then Upasna, the third year. So Varun, if you'll start us off, that'd be great. Cool, Anil. Uh, I, I tend to speak more than I'm supposed to, so please tell me no, when, it ahead, seven, when it is seven, eight, ten minutes, you say, hey, you know, you should stop. Otherwise, it becomes a problem. Right? I tend to forget. No, but good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, very happy to be here. And I think, uh, you know, some of these sessions for people like me are great, fantastic learning. Uh, pardon the internet. If if it goes down, I'll try and come back. Uh, it's, it's just been a horrible day. It's the one day after like two and a half months of working in Goa and I'll start there. Uh, I run a stockbroking platform uh, and India's largest digital platform for wealth management out of Goa uh, and out of my laptop and wherever that I can find internet, I go and it starts to work. Right. And that's a, that's the new paradigm. Right. And that's the new way. And we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll quickly give you an introduction about myself. So you get a feeling about uh, my life and I, you know, my headline life is please be ready to welcome crisis. Uh, every single crisis is the single best opportunity. And I think the world is changing so fast that uh, this time it was COVID. It obviously has its own issues. And like Anil correctly mentioned, there's a poverty, et cetera, et cetera. And the gap is widening, but in reality, an opportunity only comes out of a crisis. Right. And I think, to, I, I started looking forward to a crisis now, right? So every two, three years, I think the world is running so fast. It's like we're in this perennial washing machine. So I'm going to try and explain to you my life and very quickly PTM and then talk a bit about the Indian economy. But pleasure to be here. Uh, at the end of my session, I'm going to leave my mobile WhatsApp number for you guys and LinkedIn. So if you need something, you can always write to me, WhatsApp me personally, and we'll be happy to, uh, you know, happy to have one-to-one -one sessions if needed. But uh, so, so I'm from, uh, my parents are, uh, you know, I was brought up in a business school. So I don't know if you've heard of the school. It's called MDI Gurgaon. My father used to teach at Kellogg. So he used to travel way back, uh, you know, so he was a guest faculty at Kellogg. And so I grew up in this school and my uncles and aunties and my friends were business school professors. I think I got my first corporate finance book when I was eight, right? And I bought my first stock at 16 uh, and the stock was horrible and I bought it in the wrong way, right? So it doesn't mean that, you know, you're blessed with it, but I, I was brought up in a B school with teachers who would teach. I went on then to, uh, I was doing my chartered accountancy. I hated it. So I joined politics in Delhi, right? And I was doing a decent job of it. Then I figured politics doesn't work for me and I didn't like Delhi life. So I left and I ended up being in Cochin. So my first real job in banking was that of a sales officer, right? So I used to sell wearing one of these blue jackets in India on a bike, right? And if you are sitting in US and you know a salesperson in India, life is really, really different, right? That's true below poverty line. And that was my first job. 
uh, and I did that for a while. I was with Citibank, then I worked with Deutsche Bank, where I was employee number four of starting retail banking operations in India. And at that time, I figured that I understood that my life was meant to do zero to one, right? Somehow I was born to do zero to one. That's what I do well. So if you give me an idea on a paper or we're having coffee or beer, I will quickly take that idea, work very hard and try and bring it to reality, right? So that's something that then I realized I love doing. I feel happy doing. And so I've worked all my life in doing zero to one and in banking, right? So that's, those are the two uh, main pillars of my career. Then I studied at uh, SDA Bacconi in Italy, in Milan. My first day of B school, I wanted to be an investment banker and Lehman Brothers collapsed, right? Just to give you a sense, I know you're all students and you all must be worrying, COVID is this, COVID is that. Back in 2008, Anil may remember, Dilip may remember, but everybody else of you, including Upasana, look too young to remember. But back then there was no LinkedIn, back then there was no email, there was no doing all of this, right? And I had to find jobs. So I used to apply for 70 jobs a day. And it was tough during 2008, 2009, but I somehow managed to scrape through. And I found a job in a consulting shop as working in Dubai. From there, I ended up being in Egypt. And I realized that crisis is great because one day the Arab Spring happened and the political revolution happened. And, uh, you know, my bank building where I was working was burnt and I saw about 800 people die. A guy next to me was shot, right? So as bad as that. Uh, but at the end of it, I was 31. I got a job offer to be the head of a bank, a bank of about 2000 people. So I was appointed deputy CEO, head of retail, private banking. And the only question I asked to the guy who was CEO who made me an offer at BNP Paribas was I said, what's my business card going to look like? Because in my eyes was Leonardo DiCaprio walking into a boardroom with somebody serving a nice fancy glass of water. That was my life. Uh, but I, I got into BNP Paribas. I worked there for about eight odd years. Uh, just to give you a feeling of what I did, I used to be working in Egypt and then I moved to Paris. Uh, from Paris, I was managing a bank in the US. It's called Bank of the West. I launched a bunch of digital banks in Europe. It's called Hello Bank. I launched a digital bank in China. And when I say I, it's always a team. It's a bunch of four or five people who got together and uh, you know got that piece organized. And then at the end, India was calling. So I wanted to come back to India. And these days, Robinhood, GameStop, Tesla are a lot in the news. Right? So that's what I do for a living. So 2015, I flipped my life and ended up buying this company in India. It's called Shere Khan. Uh, it was at that time, uh, one of India's largest brokers. So I did a deal for about half a billion dollars. At 35, for me, that was the most fantastic thing that could happen to me. Another time, another day, it's a story in its own self. I bought that company. I came back to India because for me, India was calling. And you know, Anil spoke about India a bit, but 2014, 2015, our prime minister, Mr. Modi, was running around wearing these jackets. I think Dilip is wearing one of those. I can see. But you know, I was very impressed with I was very impressed with all that. And I said, you know, look, if there's one country I want to go back to. So I had this offer to be a CEO of a big bank in Europe with about 25,000 people. And I said, no, uh, if there's one place where I think I will find my heart, my place, and this is the country where economically I could progress. I'm very money minded. Uh, right? So I was very materialistic in my life. So I said, no, no, one place where I can balance my life. I can feel happy that I bring something back to somebody. And at the same time, professionally, it's so exciting that I get up in the morning to work and feel happy about it. It was India. And I had an option to go to China. I had an option to go to a bunch of other places. So I worked for the last 2015. I went back to India. Uh, I managed to broker. At the end of it, I uh, sold a company from BNP. I left it after eight odd years to OnePlus, Oppo, Realme, and Vivo. So I was with the Chinese for about a year. Uh, then my Chinese founder and me had a fallout and I ended up in Paytm. Uh, I had been following this man called Vijay Shekhar Sharma. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, you know, he's a, it's a fantastic story in its own self. Uh, one day you must invite him for a commencement or something like that. He's a, you know, he started in a small room uh, in Aligarh, 100 square meters. Uh, and today he's a owner of a 16 billion euro uh, company, a dollar company. Uh, it's called Paytm. Uh, it's India's largest company. To give you a sense of few numbers, we have about 450 million consumers, uh, about 250 million monthly active users, and we do about 40 million transactions a day. Right? I manage out of about 10 odd verticals, about 10, 12 CEOs run that shop. Uh, for Vijay, I manage the wealth business. So I'm your equivalent of Robin Hood for India. Right? So if you're, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately at the wrong time at the right place. <laughs> it's like everybody's talking about Robin Hood and GameStop and the short squeeze and all of that. These days, I think American, Americans are, you know, there's a whole revolution happening in America in my business. But yeah, that's, that's Varun. Uh, very happy to be here. Like I said, um, maybe, you know, Anil asked three levels of questions. Uh, there's the India question, there's a sector question and there's Paytm question, right? Uh, India question, I think, and this is my opinion. Uh, you know, Anil had mentioned about problems, mentioned about government, but I will tell you, in my mind, 2020 to 2030, the single best decade for India, I think it's coming, right? At least for my sector, I think it is the single most important, fantastic period. Why? Because 
multiple things have come together the first thing that's come together is government and policy making uh, government is government there will always be uh, yeses and nos i honestly don't care who's governing as long as governance is moving forward uh, it takes a lot to move a country where everybody can write everything forward uh, you know it's it's not easy uh, and uh, that's happening i am amazed with the kind of policies the government is doing what's even nicer is the bureaucracy right so if you just look at digital payments in india uh, maybe we are 30 years ahead of the states right if you look at the only country that i think in benchmark with is china where very recently in the last couple of years we started to catch up right and i think now technologically digital payments infrastructure from a technology point of view is fantastic but that's happened because policy making is allowing it and the government is recognizing the need to shift gears so point 1 i think that's fantastic point 2 is what i really love about india is a number of young people who are setting up startups right and it, it's crazy right if you come to bangalore where dilip is all you need to do is throw a stone most probably you will hit the head of a guy who's running his own startup and has failed in four and is trying his fifth it is san francisco remade with an energy with capital funding that is unimaginable right it's just fantastic so if you ever come to bangalore if the one place in india i would welcome all of you to work is bangalore right it is just fantastic in the way bangalore is growing and the way bangalore is transforming but there are the centers of excellence but i think there's huge craze of startups in india now and they're getting funded and the talent is amazing right so kind of people working there it is just fantastic so i think the second big change happening is the startup environment and the willingness to disrupt the third thing that's happening is on the consumer side uh, for the first time in india all of a sudden a company like mine and i'll give you a small example we do mutual funds uh, and in mutual funds you know there are two types there's something called regular mutual fund and direct mutual fund but we do direct which essentially means we don't make money so i don't make any money when i sell my mutual funds right but to give you a feeling we have at least one customer from 99% of all zip codes or pin codes in india that makes me bigger than the indian post office or the largest bank in india anywhere right so i'm and to have that one customer i have one app and a small team of 350 people and uh, we are all techies right so we have about 290 tech plus data analytics people and we have no other uh, like all of us are working off our laptops of 20 different cities but we are able to do a kind of financial inclusion that would have not been possible before to give you a feeling of that in india before you could invest in a mutual fund for 10 12 dollars minimum we bought it down to a dollar 0.5 so in a dollar and 50 cents you can onboard the first customer or 100 rupees now that's fantastic right and we do it at a cost of operation of 0.03 paisa which is very 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 thin right so we've we've managed to do it but we're not the only ones so that's possible because of the consumer all of a sudden changing because of phones in their hand technology in their hand right so that's the third thing and i think the last thing that's happening to india is finally after decades of hard work i i kind of feel that it's the india moment so the next 10 years i think the last 10 15 belong to china they've done a fantastic job i have a lot of admiration for what that country has done uh, the states obviously has done a great things and i have my opinion personally on what they could have done better but you know if there's a third country that's doing fantastically well i think it's india so all those things coming together and then covid happened covid has flipped india 10 years ahead because all of a sudden what happened is all the legacy businesses right at least in you know i am talking financial services because that's that's the only one part i can talk credibly the rest i wouldn't claim to talk the rest is gossip which is useless in any case right but for what i talk i think on the financial side I think we have lost uh, Varun. It seems, yeah. Lost Varun, yeah. Well, but oh, there he's he back. Is. Varun, he's back. Uh, maybe if you could, sorry. if you could wind up in a few minutes, then we'll yeah. have the left talk. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so yeah. So, so I think it's fantastic to see that uh, whole focus. And the last comment I would make about PTM: uh, we have about thirty million, forty million merchants in India. We bank about twenty million of those. Uh, we have a digital bank which runs on an app, which is sixty-five million consumers. Uh, we run a company called Paytm First Games, which is India's largest gaming company. We run a ticket show. Uh, I think what we've realized is once you build a moat as a company, then the only question is how do you stay relevant in consumers' life? And you know, Anil was asking what's the single biggest challenge. I think a single biggest challenge is uh, is the consumer focus and staying relevant in your life. So I'm going to stop there, Anil. But uh, yeah, Thank that's you. great. That's good. Thanks, Varun. Dilip, you're on. Yeah. 
Thank you, Anil. And uh, uh, to begin with, uh, let me express my gratitude to Janvi and Nivedita and their team uh, for giving me the privilege to be part of this panel this evening. That's you know wonderful to be here. Uh, and Anil, I must uh, complain that uh, you you put me in a position where it's very difficult to follow Varun. That's such an interesting personal journey, such an interesting business. And Upasana following me is running a very interesting startup. So I feel like a a, a very ordinary filling between two interesting slices of bread. Uh, if, if it were a sandwich, I would be that uh, that mayonnaise and potato in the in the middle is what I would feel like. Uh, and healthcare is a, a fairly uninteresting business. Uh, but you know, yeah, that's that's a card that I'm dealt with. So let me. Oh, see you're being way too modest. <laughs> Uh, uh, to talk briefly about uh, myself, Anil, that uh, I'm currently the managing director and chief executive officer of Manipal, Manipal Hospitals. And prior to this, I was with PPG Capital uh, as their senior advisor for healthcare for a while. And uh, before that, uh, I was with Advent International, another private equity firm. Uh, as uh, when they took over, they did one of the first uh, control deals in India in healthcare where a private equity owned a large healthcare chain out of uh, South India. And uh, I moved in with them as the CEO to execute the business thesis and exited with them. So, uh, so this has been my recent experience, uh, about 18 years in healthcare and about 14 years prior to that with uh, finance and strategy. So that's where I am. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Indian economy, uh, it's a good time because the survey came out yesterday. The annual uh, economic survey came out last evening. Uh, it, it is a survey that is conducted by the government. So people have their views on the data and everything else. But assuming all that is fair, uh, what the survey actually shows a fairly optimistic picture. Uh, it, the, the contraction expected in, in, the, in the current financial year ending in, the, uh, in March is expected only about 7.7%. And to put in the context, the first quarter itself had a negative 25% uh, contraction, right? So, and the second quarter was again minus seven or minus eight. So what it means is H2 became practically similar to last year's H2 for the weighted average contraction to remain at about seven, 7.7%. 7 what it meant is that the second half of this year is expected to be fairly similar to second half of last year. And that's dramatically different than what many of us expected uh, in February, March, or April of last year when the pandemic hit. Uh, maybe because we all uh, assumed the worst and uh, we all modeled the worst case scenario, but possibly it had not played out all that badly. Uh, the second thing is the expectation, which is also concurred by IMF, is that next year, FI 21-22 would grow at uh, about 12%. While certainly there is a low base effect, you know, growing from a negative weight, uh, you know, that helps. But even in real terms, it means about two to three period. Mm -hmm. Possibly India uh, did not do as badly as, uh, you know, originally we all thought. But one thing we need to keep in mind uh, is that uh, part of the growth that you might see in H2 could be of the rebound kind of demand that, you know, sectors which are doing very well, uh, for example, automobiles, uh, hospitality, travel, healthcare to some extent, uh, stock market that Varun has been, you know, I'm seeing activities related to FinTech. So some of it could be because of the rebound uh, uh, pent up demand, but, uh, uh, but keeping that aside, when we look at the, uh, the positive news out of the survey, what we would need to also keep in mind is that this growth should not be without creating jobs. You know, uh, in coming out of a recession, there is an always an opportunity to bounce back, but a jobless bounce back. You know, that is something that India would need to watch out for. Jobless bounce back is not what the country would require. We would need jobs to come back, especially given the informal sector's role in India. I think all of us will have to really understand what has happened to that sector. You know, it will take many, many months from now to really figure out what happened to the informal sector, the migrant labor, the casual labor, uh, the people who are working on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was something we'll have to understand. But the headline news seems to be that uh, the pandemic was fairly well navigated. Uh, and given the complexity of the country in terms of uh, the size of the people, and like you alluded to earlier, Anil, 
the poverty issue, uh, you know, and, and the pre-pandemic uh, slowdown in growth, which was there, I think in the overall context, perhaps the country did not do as bad as one would have thought, uh, one would have expected initially. Uh, now to talk about healthcare sector for a minute, conventional wisdom would be that, you know, healthcare and hospitals would do well in a pandemic, you know, that would be the conventional wisdom, but it did not happen like that uh, this time, especially because of the hesitancy of people who were not afflicted by COVID to approach a hospital. So what we found in the healthcare sector and what we found as hospitals is that anybody who could afford to postpone a visit to a hospital, afford to postpone a consultation with the doctor did that. So what has happened is uh, the, the, the percentage of people affected in India is less than 1%. You know, it's a country of 1.35 billion and the total number of infections in India even now is less than 10 million. But this small number has actually resulted in a lot of other areas. You know, India is also uh, in, in some way uh, suffering from a, a severe burden of chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, renal disorders. So people putting off treatment in, in several of these areas are actually endangering themselves far more than you know, they would have done contacting virus. So that is something that we would have to wait and see what would be uh, the hidden cost of, uh, of the pandemic outside of the direct impact on the healthcare on account of people who are impacted by COVID. What would be the hidden cost to something we will have to figure out? Uh, one thing which possibly uh, a positive rub off would be the digital initiative that the healthcare sector could roll out. Uh, India did not have a policy for telemedicine, teleconsultation for the last many decades. You know, uh, uh, there was no uh, regulatory framework which was available. But post pandemic government could put that together in about three to four weeks time. So what we found is that there is an opportunity. People are willing, you know, given the connectivity uh, and you know those facilities which are available people are willing to move to telemedicine and teleconsultation given an option so uh, that is something which could augur well for the future uh, because large parts of india still have a problem of access to healthcare while the cities and, and large towns are fairly well served in terms of metrics which are comparable with the western world Many parts of India are really uh, suffering from inadequate infrastructure. So one side, a positive rub off of COVID would be that the, the distant uh, consultation, telemedicine, teleconsultation would possibly become an order of the day going forward. And that could improve the access and, afford, and access and ability to treat people who are in the rural areas or semi-urban areas. So and with 5G spectrum getting rolled out, and like Varun said, you know, a lot of people getting used to the digital ways of accessing service. We are hoping healthcare also would benefit from a digital habit that people would develop. So that is possibly one rub of the healthcare sector would, would derive from COVID. And uh, uh, the finally, to talk about, uh, about my own organization, we believe that uh, uh, this is a temporary blip. Uh, the healthcare sector in India is poised to do well for much, much more fundamental reasons. One is, of course, a large population and therefore the inherent demand which is there, the changing demographics, the aging population of India, the changing morbidity pattern. So these are the uh, levers which create uh, the, the demand uh, and, and the increasing access and affordability. So healthcare, we believe, would continue to grow well. This would be a blip in terms of uh, one year that we would lose. So I think all of us, large healthcare players. There's a lot of private equity interest in healthcare in India for the same reason. I think the in investments would continue. We ourselves are in the middle of closing a transaction. We have signed a definite agreement to acquire Columbia Asia assets in India. We are waiting, we have just got the regulatory clearance. We are waiting for another government approval to consummate the transaction. So we feel it's the right time to invest. There would be stressed assets available, and you know, and there is possibility of consolidation. So maybe COVID will also end up in, in a manner that you know, three or four large healthcare delivery players would be able to consolidate their presence, absorb some of the stressed assets, and maybe that's the way the, the sector would look going forward. So 
I, I would stop there, Anil. I think you are on mute, Anil. You're right. Sorry, that's wonderful. Thank you, Dilip. And Upasna, you're on next. Yeah. I've learned so much from uh, both Varun and Dilip right now, but uh, I would like to um, club all three and tell you that I was uh, born in Apollo, I was brought up in Apollo, and I will continue to serve and enhance Apollo. So uh, I'm third generation, I'm the founder's granddaughter. And uh, for me, work is passion. And I feel that as long as there's love, passion, and clear intent, any business is successful. So that's my base for doing anything. And that's what we've been brought up with. Apollo is not just, my family is not just 5, 10, 15 people. It's more than 1 lakh people that come to work every day to serve one another. So that's what I believe in. And that's what we all as a family believe in. So um, when I obviously, having said that, I do love my country and I am super happy with the government and I have no complaints, but I chose in my field of business, uh, I said, okay, fine, while my family takes care of doctors, patients and investors, I will focus on uh, taking care of the underprivileged population because I, I grew up. I've grown up with them. So the designations I hold in Apollo are, uh, I'm actually, I manage the CSR for uh, the group and I run FHPL, their TPA, and I'm working on a startup, which is Your Life, which is in the wellness space. So in the insurance, in the uh, wellness and in the CSR space. And I feel all are linked, all are linked with passion and love. So that's something that um, I've, really concentrating on. So as uh, Dilip and Varun said, you know, our economy is actually bouncing back. Uh, technology has accelerated. We are 10 years ahead. And the migrant workers, every migrant worker has a cell phone. So they're consuming, con my husband's in films, so they're consuming content, they're liking his uh, videos, and it, it's just been amazing. So, you know, the, the, though they ha don't have money to eat, they have money to consume content and have a phone and communicate. So I think that's something that uh, we all need to think about in India. And I really think that India will have a V-shaped recovery. And Q2 was a bit slow, but Q3 is looking amazing. The health insurance space is going up by 21%, which means that Indians are concentrating on living, uh, are concentrating on living a better quality of life. And I think that's the core of the success of any nation, the need for a better quality of life. Having said that, I go back to government policies and I want to let people know that the government is doing so much, but you know, some of us just need to go out there, educate people and let them know about these great government policies that are out there. So um, for the migrant workers, they, uh, they have, of course, Ayushman Bharat that takes care of their families, healthcare and medical needs that we also cover in five states. And it's been a huge help during the pandemic. And then after that, there's also a rural employment guarantee scheme that provides 250 days of minimum wage to people in rural areas. Imagine a country with so, with so many people that have lost their jobs. The government is actually going out there to help them. So I think it's really, really uh, amazing what the government is doing for them. But yes, of course, uh, there are some uh, small changes that they can do. Healthcare was not, uh, the GDP was not, focused on healthcare very much, but now it's happening. And I think that's a great thing because today the concentration on vaccines has been amazing. I got vaccinated. I'm feeling great about it, but I urge a lot of frontline workers are not taking the vaccine. So, you know, we are encouraging them to do so. It's, um, it's a whole cycle. A lot of education is required in this space. A lot of skilling is required in this space. And there's a, there's a real need for Indians to join the medical workforce. Our Indian doctors and nurses are loved worldwide. So if we can get more people into uh, skilling them and getting them to be nurses or doctors, I think it'll really help the world by and large, even uh, our country first and definitely the world as well. And um, so during the lockdown, we launched a product which was called Apollo 247 and people just caught on. These were digital um, 
digital consults. So people didn't need to come into the hospital to get in touch with their doctor. The family doctors got more empowered. Our doctors felt that they were doing good work and that's what gave them fulfillment. And statistics show that um, 50 million Indians used online consultations, which is a 300% growth. And it's, it's been amazing. And that's what we want to focus on in every aspect, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, medicine delivery, whether it's getting second opinions, telemedicine now. Telemedicine is something that has really, really helped me, especially with the group CSR, because you uh, in every nook and corner, even the yatras that you go to, you'll see our telemedicine centers because they help the people there who you know want to visit the temple of their choice and still do it out of faith so you see the most unhealthy people old people young people everyone going there but faith drives them and our telemedicine centers are there to help them reach their destination and i think that's the beauty of india but what is true telemedicine we are getting into the 5g mode and true telemedicine i think is when the doctor sits at sits uh, is on the operation table and can get a second opinion immediately from anywhere across the world true telemedicine that will be phenomenal which is going to happen in india very soon is the doctor doing robotic surgery where he doesn't have to be at the location or on the table and can do it from anywhere and that I think will cause, will help the curative burden of um, India. And speaking about prevention, which is my space, and um, I will bring a lot of um, passion into this because I think prevention, uh, a McKinsey report suggested that every $1 spent in prevention gives you a 4x return rather than in the, uh, the money spent in the curative business. So, um, rather, so we took this step as a family uh, in Apollo to focus on prevention. And we've seen so many people can actually prevent most of the lifestyle diseases. So our focus has been on nutrition, on mental well-being, on exercise. And that's what we've done. So the platform that we started focuses on that. And today, as important as a doctor is, so is your nutritionist, so is your mental well-being professional, and so is your trainer. And our, and our population is going out there taking advice from everyone that's an influencer without a degree. And so that's what we wanted to bring into the structure of the Indian healthcare system is to bring wellness as a huge part of it because that is the only thing that can reduce our disease bur burden our prime minister is amazing yoga is from india we are very proud we very proudly own it and i think that uh, each one of us should start doing it more than just talking about it including me so um having said that uh okay i spoke about telemedicine and i had uh, made some notes about uh, the tech. So all of us know that uh, the private health space in India is leading and on par with uh, the US and uh, others as well. You know, our skill set, our people, and the volumes that we do can't compare to anybody else. So I think that gives us the edge and the skill set is also superb in uh, India. And the government is now working on a national health uh, mission, which is a unified platform like they just did for uh, payments. So uh, when people have their medical records together, it gives them an analysis of their life. And you, everyone wants to get a better score. We are a highly competitive nation. We definitely want a better score than uh, anyone else. So as long as there's competition, as long as you want to live a better quality of life, a, better, a healthy life, as long as you watch Bollywood, I think that people will be interested in healthcare because behind all that healthcare, behind all sports and Bollywood, there's a bunch of healthcare. So I think that's what we are bringing into this space and that's what will make our nation grow. I know it may sound a bit floozy, but let me tell you, that's the base of our country. Our country runs on that, but... Um, that's where we are. And about uh, retail in India and about uh, e-commerce, I think it's really changing. And uh, in the pharma, uh, in the pharmacy, online pharmacy, there are only 10,000 pharmacy uh, retail chains in uh, pharmacy retail 
uh, outlets that are owned by large companies, but there are six lakh small pharmacies that are present in India. Why would we kill them? They're doing, they have, they have an intuitive instinct and loyalty from their market. So I think that this, uh, it's just going to balance itself out and the country is just going to grow. And I, I feel, I personally feel that the world will use us as, as an example to grow. So I would like to end with that. Wonderful. This is, these are great comments from our four speakers. And uh, as you can see, they're all very positive on, on India, these health sectors and the finance sector and the future of their companies. And uh, so we're going to have an informal discussion among the four of us. I think all the three of you can unmute yourselves. We can, I don't think there's much background noise here. So we can have an informal discussion. Do you have questions for each other or what do you see as the common elements and does it reinforce your views or do you have some other issues to raise? I, I have a comment to make for both Dilip uh, and Upasana. Uh, yeah. You know, f f first piece of advice, I wish Dilip was listed. I was by his stock and, uh, you know, Apollo, I'm definitely going to buy tomorrow and go long on it. You know, <laughs> having heard, having heard you know, I, I, I'm a stock market guy, right? So that's what I think about it. No, but I'm, I'm not allowed to trade or invest, but no, I think it was pleasure, pleasure learning from both of them. It was fantastic. It, it helped me. Uh, you know, Dilip was mentioning about a sandwich. People actually buy a sandwich for what's in between. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if, if, if bread were to sell, life would be very different except in France. No, but I, I have a question for both of them. Uh, Anil, if you don't mind, I'd like yeah, to ask. Yeah, go ahead, them. please. You know, India is seeing this fantastic story of, in my mind, as an outsider to your sector of 1MG and, uh, you know, the whole Practo uh, business, right? So Practo for some of you outside is a digital telemedicine as Dilip has defined it or digital, uh, you know, and I've used Practo, uh, Dilip, I'm, I, and, you know, I, I think I have Apollo and Manipal both because I travel a lot. And, uh, you know, this is the first time I got shit scared of going to hospital. I, and during COVID, I broke my hand. I had a back injury. I had everything, but I refused to go to hospital. Right, because I'm just so scared of uh, going. But uh, you know, some of these digital applications have really helped. So I would love to know between 1MG, which is dominating the pharmacy delivery space, and private equity, and the Americans are deeply invested because I know we have, uh, and you know, Dilip is XPVC, so he understands the sector. But how do you look at 1MG and uh, how do you look at Practo? Because uh, you know, I think they are doing a fantastic job, at least as a consumer. But I would love to hear both your thoughts on that, you know, a bit deeper on how you see that. Upasana, you want to go first? No, I please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so Varun, uh, without specifically commenting on 1MG or Practo, you know, if, if you were to talk about uh, pharmaceutical and pharmacy delivery or e-pharmacy companies and also uh, consultation aggregation, you know, uh, as a concept which Practo and others are doing, I think both the e-pharmacy the e certainly could do very well. I think uh, most of the people who are involved in e-pharmacy already have uh, racked up volumes. People are, you know, all of us, I think uh, many of us got accounts with uh, many of these e-pharmacy uh, uh, delivery companies. And I think uh, uh, people are getting used to it and with connectivity improving to, uh, you know, outside of cities and, and large towns. I think this would become really a, a fact of life. I think many, two or three years ago, the food delivery was not, is not heard of, right? Now, uh, now every family would have multiple accounts with multiple food uh, food delivery guys and you know it's no longer food on the table is no longer a worry in that sense you know so i think e pharmacy would become a fact of life but on the uh, on the remote consultation like i mentioned earlier also varun i think indians would still you know i think the preference we would need a, a, a mindset change you know a doctor consultation for most parts of india even now is you being probed and poked and you know a, a little bit of touchy feely kind of a consultation is what what people expect. Now COVID in, induced a change of habit and uh, like I said, we found that in Manipal about twenty percent of all our outpatient consultation moved to our app and telemedicine. You know the, the, the during the lockdown, but what what we also found out is that when the lockdown was lifted. Of the 20%, maybe about 10% went back to physical consultation because they felt more comfortable there. The, the second issue around that, uh, Varun, is that there would be certain specialities which are more amenable for uh, a remote consultation. That, you know, people uh, like, uh, you know, that, uh, like Apollo, for example, or Manipal or Portis, 
who primarily focus on tertiary and quaternary care kind of treatments, maybe the follow-up consults or the second or third consults may happen, could happen on telemedicine or remote consultation. But many a time, even the doctors would want the first consult to be a little, you know, in person. I think uh, that makes a bit of a difference. But where I would see a difference, uh, uh, an enhancement would be for rural areas, you know, like Upasana was mentioning earlier about improving access. Now, look at uh, uh, areas, in, say, in, in Bihar or Orissa or Jharkhand, which may not have ready access to a good quality local hospital. Then telemedicine is better than not having access at all. So, uh, so if, if they were to use a consultation mode to reach out to a doctor in Apollo or Manipal, and you know that would be better than not having an access or going to a local quack, for instance. So I think there is an opportunity to, to, to grow, opportunity to substantially scale up for both these platforms that you alluded to, Varun. But I think a little bit of mindset or a cultural shift may be required among the consumers to at least get used to remote consultation. I think e-pharmacy would, would certainly, because I think uh, so long as the quality of the product is assured, I don't think people would be worried about using an e-pharmacy. But the teleconsultation, I think, would, would grow. But the pace of growth would depend on experience, word of mouth, kind of publicity, which will, and, and acceptance about connectivity and the, and the ability to accept a uh, advice from a doctor who has not touched and felt you, that would be the cultural change that India may require. Upasana, over to you, please. Thank you. That was deep insight. And, you know, I also believe in that because I've seen it. You know, our hospitals were empty during the pandemic, but now people are coming back and they use the teleconsults cons actually for second opinions. And uh, exactly, you know, for uh, like, I feel that uh, people use uh, online if uh, for more GP care rather than, you know, other specialized services, that's one. But when it comes to e-pharmacy, my question is, even I have a question, is whether these e-pharmacy um, uh, companies can sustain their discounts over time? And what happens when the discounts run out? And, you know, food delivery did well only because it, aggregated the smaller players that existed in e-pharmacy that hasn't happened yet. So I did ask my mother that question because she runs the e-pharmacy bit. And uh, well, she has a fantastic answer, but you need to ca uh, call her for that. <laughs> we will. Thank you. That's happening in the US too, that uh, telemedicine has grown here during the days of the pandemic. But most people think it is going to shrink back to somewhere between the original state and the current state. Yeah, that people do want to be touched by their doctor for many cases. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, Anil, if I could come in for a minute, uh, you know, one one area which was uh, uh, which, which is actually getting more acceptance in India is the need for mental health. I think yes. the pandemic and and the lockdown, I think, really uh, you know exacerbated uh, the, the conditions, really highlighted the need for that. Yeah. Uh, so there are many mental health startups which are now available that, you know, who would do teleconsultation because that is something amenable to teleconsultation. Yeah, that's it's right. It's a conversation, right? You know, yeah. so that's amenable to teleconsultation. The only backend uh, kind of area that you would need to figure out is whether you get to talk to the same doctor every time who's got your history or, you know, would it be a pool who's available at the back end? I think those are things one can figure out. Right. But I think the pandemic certainly brought out mental health as a key area. Uh, you know, that's what's one input, I, something I learned during this last one. Thank you. Do any of you have any other questions, the panel speakers? Let me ask you a question. Um, so I, I think it's great that all of three of you are very optimistic about India. So explain to me as an outsider here, that much of what I read about India, especially in the Western press, tends to be more negative. Like in the last few weeks, the main story about India is the farmers protesting in Delhi and uh, some of the protests turning violent and so on. <coughs> so is, there a is India just doing a bad job of PR or what's, why is the press about India so much more negative than what 
all of you feel living in India and working in India that so why is what's going wrong here? So I'll take that question and but I have only a one line answer for that. I think you should consume content on social media about India rather than um, you know, TV, because social media has a much prettier picture and a much more true picture to speak about India. That's interesting. Maybe I can go second. And, you know, I, I'll fully first second uh, Upasana saying, hey, uh, you know, do, do your own research, right? Get, get deep into it. And, uh, you know, if, if you're bothered about the headlines, it's like seeing a Bollywood movie or a Tollywood movie, right? And I think, you know, then you get to see what you get to see and you're going with that mind frame. Uh, but if, if you go deep into India, there's so many nice stories happening. I don't think India is criticism free. What I love about India is you can write what you want. You can uh, almost say what you want. Uh, and I, I think that's good, right? Uh, and I, you know, personally, uh, there are a lot of people who criticize us as brands. And I'll give you a small example. I do customer service myself, which means in a week about, I take about 100 queries. So I have 7 million customers. You go to my Twitter handle, the only people who complain to me are cribbing their life out. Like I'm a mental wellness specialist for them. Okay, and I talk to them. I literally talk to 20 customers a week and it's horrible, right? Because when they are talking to me, you know, they, they, they pay me 50 rupees, but for 50 rupees is less than a dollar. They own Paytm, right? And you know, for those 20 minutes, you have to be owned by them, which mm -hmm. is cool. Now, I think that's what is happening with Western press and Western media, where the true story is not there. I have 7 million clients. I have maybe 1% of them unhappy. They're 99% happy. Uh, you get to see only the 1%. You don't get to see the 99% because India as a society, the happy people don't speak. The critical people are more open to criticize. Unfortunately, the media has also split up. The media loves criticism because that's what people pay for. And that's what advertisers love because it all works like that. Right? It's the, the world of capitalism, if you may. Right? And, uh, and I, you know, I, I would not go there. I think uh, I, yeah, if, if, if somebody was to do their own research and somebody was to see India 10 years back and India today and India 10 years from today, there's a very nice story happening. Is it perfect? It's not, right? But neither am I. So, so from my perspective, I think you have to take the pinch of salt. And I love the fact that you can criticize. Uh, is the farm bill the right one? Uh, you know, I, I haven't done an in-depth study on it, so I will refrain from commenting. I understand there are two sides of the coin. Like in everything, there are certain losers and certain winners. The one who shouts harder, uh, the one who has the ability to influence harder wins. But that's that's the cool part about democracy, right? And uh, you know, eventually that adjusts itself. So yeah, so, so you know, there's a lot of bad news, but I'm 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 fairly positive that inside that bad news, uh, there's, there's a lot of nice stuff happening. But you have to be here to see it. Uh, you know, if uh, the, the final two bits from me, Anil, would be that you know, I think world over, it's not only an India thing. World over, I think polarized views are what what is being seen most, right? You know, it is either extreme views. I think somehow that middle middle path, uh, even in reportage uh, or even in uh, opinion, which is getting published is, is missing out. You know, even even going back to US for a minute, you know, uh, the, the current, uh, you know, headlines, either, you know, you, you are either pro something or anti something, right? I'm saying you, you really are not able to uh, uh, have a neutral view on most things. I think that's how a lot of media seem to be projecting it. Uh, you know, the capital attack which happened on 6th of Jan, I don't think that's what the U.S. is, right? You know, the, the, all the headlines world over is now, you know, this is what happened in the U.S. But I don't think that represents from whatever I've seen of that country, I don't think it represents most people. Uh, so similarly, I think world over, I think polarized views maybe sells better, PRPs are better, you know, but I think there is still scope for a, a, a middle path, a scope for a balanced voice. It's what, what I think, at least that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, that's what I, I would leave. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, let's open up to the audience. And uh, I think you can all hear me. If you have any questions, please raise your hand uh, on, uh, on Zoom and uh, we'll recognize speakers. And we have three wonderful panelists here. You can ask them any questions you like about India, any sector of the economy you're interested in, or any company or anything related to India. So anybody from the audience have questions?
I'm sure it's not a shy class. No, it's not a shy class. <laughs> we just have to get used to this technology. And uh, it's like who goes first, but yeah, please feel right. free to ask anything. You know, if this was a regular class, I would just call on some somebody in the audience and force them to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so all of you were talking about how, you know, 5G is kind of becoming the norm and everybody has a phone in their hand, right? So they have access to the internet and everything. But when we're talking about these underrepresented populations, right? Yes, they have access to this technology, but there's also a digital literacy barrier, right? So in that education, like we talked about wellness, we talked about finance and getting that knowledge. How can the literacy barrier be crossed so that they can actually get this education and invest their time into using these resources and learning more about it. Because you're right, you know, they have access to social media and they have access to films and consuming that type of content, but that's more on the entertainment side, right? And we, when we talk about wellness, when we talk about financial um, literacy, that's about changing their life. So how can we cross that barrier to actually educate the population and use that technology for their benefit? Good question. Go ahead, any of the panelists would you like to respond? I can go if uh, Upasna, you want to answer? No, 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 go please, ahead. please. Thank you. So, so I, I'll give you maybe uh, two, three examples, uh, slightly diverse ones. And so we concretely talk about how a company like Paytm is using it. Maybe that will be a good example. Uh, you know, 2014, uh, Vijay decided uh, one day that, hey, uh, you know, Indians need to stop using cash, right? Uh, and this was way before demonetization, right? Uh, and so most people think Paytm got made during demonetization. Most people don't know that we had about... 100,000 servers ready to wait for India to change. Demonetization happened. We were preparing for it for eight years, right? It was not me. It was Vijay, who's the founder of the company who did it, right? Now, if you go back, how did that big change happen? And how did everybody move to digital cash? Because with the minute they moved to digital cash, and, uh, you know, just to give you a feeling, last month we did 2 billion UPI instant mobile transactions, all the way ranging from 1 rupee to a lack of rupees, right? That's like a cent to $1,500, uh, and on 2 billion transactions a month, the failure rate was 0.03%, right? Or 0.3%, So, which is not much, right? If you think about it. Uh, now, how did the change happen? That happened because at the beginning, there was a lot of cash back. So we actually gave cash incentive to customers, but then the infrastructure was built around risk management, around fraud control, around real time things, right? Now, did things go wrong? Yes, they did. But the human mind is fantastic, right? If you make your products super simple, like if to hit one button and it works, it works, right? And I think all of a sudden in India, now you have 550 million people doing digital payments, right? It's a four-year journey that's happened not because of Paytm only. I think we started it. Then midway through the journey, we launched QR codes, right? Now in India, about 26 million QR codes are used every day. It's a crazy number. China is at about 150 million. Uh, everybody else in the world is nowhere close, right? Now, the first time QR code was introduced to a vegetable vendor who's completely illiterate. Uh, you know, for him, it was a sticker, but it started to work, right? And he saw the advantage. He said, you know, what will I lose? So companies like ours, I think, and, and the best part was how do we train people about QR code? We put a video on YouTube, right? And we put the video in 30 languages and the video was one minute because we knew at second number 37, so 36 seconds, you lose attention. 37 second, 80% drop off. So we had to time it in 36 and get the user to see till the end, right? And that's the trick. There's small digital tricks and, you know, another day we'll do that. But we did that and the video was a hit because people are seeing in their regional languages. This is localization, right? And I'll give you an example about my business, which is maybe a bit ahead, right? So financial inclusion happened for 500 million Indians. When they built a digital footprint, just to give you a feeling, we did about 5 million micro loans for about $7 a loan, $7 a loan. Huh? The loan amount is $7, not the fees that you charge. All digitally, all micro done in a second and a half on an average, right? And our loss rates on those loans are less than 1%, okay? Because it's built off your digital footprint. Now, the, in, a, in a bank, the minimum cost of processing a loan is $70. Now, how do we educate a customer about it? Because we get him to take a $7 loan, right? So this guy, if he goes outside, is borrowing at 36%, 45%, or, you know, you can't even imagine the kind of borrowing these people do and what all they give up to borrow. And the last example I'll give you from a pure, let's say, investment side is we're working on a small pilot with drivers right now, uh, which is a very, very affected society during COVID. And we're getting them to save 100 rupees a week, okay, which is a dollar 0.5 a week. It's a very, very marginal part of India's society. 
and we're very happy to do it. And what we did there was first step, we gave them only two buttons. Okay, see, there's a lot of talk about financial literacy, financial education, et cetera. Yes, I can do, we, we've done thousands of initiatives, but I think a tech and a product company needs to think a bit differently because people do WhatsApp, right? If 800 million Indians can send a WhatsApp message, I ask them, why can't they invest in a mutual fund? Very simple question. How do you do it? So we built a very simple interface. It's in pilot. We give them two buttons and only one amount. They can't change anything in that screen. So either they can hit sell or they can hit buy and they can only save weekly and there's nothing else to do. When we spoke to the company and I am not allowed to reveal the name because of an NDA, but we spoke to them, they said the adoption of the drivers will be 5%. 85% of drivers wanted to open an account in 24 hours. Okay. Now, and we didn't have that space because obviously we planned a pilot for thousand customers, right? So we had to tell all of them, Naini, this is a pilot and you're not for you, but just imagine the strength and all that we did there was put one screen. That's it. So I think it's a question of how you use product and technology eventually and you safeguard clients, right? Obviously as a responsible company and I loved what Upasana said, I'm going to catch up with Upasana later because I really loved her theme of sustainable life. Right. Uh, and, you know, in banking and stock markets, people say we are capitalist and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we also have a nice side to our lives. But uh, yeah. so, so, so I think it comes down to building great products, great technology with a bit of responsibility. As long as you protect the user, you're fine. Right. At scale. Right. I'm now talking 100 million users. So. Here's a, there's a good question that might segue from this. And Opasna, you can answer this. Uh, it's a question from one of somebody in the audience, Martha Kirps. And she says the gap between the affluent, well-educated and the poor, less educated was mentioned at the beginning of the panel. It's an issue in India and in the US and elsewhere. How is it being addressed by business in India? Okay, so that is a first, I think, uh, how is it being addressed as business in India is I think because of the pandemic, people are uh, showing business leaders are showing a lot of empathy. And they are working towards creating jobs with uh, more and creating more employment during this time. And um, the other thing that I think that's uh, really important is that maybe we need to bring in innovation to uh, remove the inequality amongst people. I was just thinking about it here. It's a wild thought because, you know, from the richest of the richest people to the poorest of the poorest people watch films or do uh, or, you know, consume good food, the same recipes. Mm -hmm. And the ingredients are only two or three. So if we can use innovation to bridge that gap, I think India is doing a phenomenal job, actually, you know, because people, the thing about caste and all that, people like to talk about it, but I think the gap has come down. Today, as a woman, I know a lot of issues of women are uh, spoken, but as a woman leader, I feel very proud. And a lot of women are taking pride in themselves and in their race and in their ethnicity and in their, you know, um, gender. And I think that's something that people need to talk about more because women today are feeling more empowered whether it's uh, the US and in India. So in terms of business, I think uh, businesses are, real, uh, are realizing the importance of equality, of, of acting with empathy. And I think that is the main thing that they can do right now, whether it's the government, whether it's the business uh, leaders right now during this pandemic, I feel everyone needs to make their heart a little bigger. That's good. Any other, uh, Varun or... Uh... Do you want to comment on that or should we move I, on? I, I would like to an example, but I comment for a to... minute. Uh, you know, yeah. so I think uh, poverty and uh, inequality, like you also alluded to in the in the beginning of the panel, Anil, are, are two two somewhat different issues. I think it, uh, you know, uh, poverty is fairly straightforward. Uh, inequality is when we talk about the disparity between earnings of you know the top ten versus the bottom ten kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, all the studies have shown the way out of poverty is growth. That, you know, uh, the 80% of the people who have been lifted out of poverty, uh, it has happened because of growth year, year after year, decade after year, decade after decade. I think consistent growth is what lifts people out of poverty. But consistent growth also, you know, also increases the inequality. That, you know, growth actually helps the rich to grow faster. 
and you know there is, uh, so i think that inequality widens but i think addressing poverty is the first issue therefore growth is a must but inequality possibly is a corollary or side effect of that i think if you have to choose between one or two i would say addressing poverty is, comes first inequality can you know i think it is something we will have to deal with subsequently it's it's, it's only one point sorry i would like to add that you know the um, the definition of poverty has to change what is the current definition of poverty because you know i go to the tribals in india and i see that you know they have much better benefits than me and hmm. uh, you know they they are living a fulfilling life and they are doing it out of their choice so what is the meaning of poverty i think that needs to be redefined and once we redefine those all these gaps will be uh, filled interesting anil maybe i can just yeah, yeah, go ahead so of uh, you know the gap right and I'll, i'll take a capital market example you all know what's an initial public offering or an ipo mm -hmm. right so when an ipo comes typically rich people end up making a lot of money and uh, you know and because they invest and they are obviously advanced so we launched our ipo product about 3 months back and i'll give you a small story right um, we had this one consumer who i spoke to who wrote me a very nice email right so in india when you invest in an ipo and in december there were three ipos they listed at 130% gain so if you put 100 dollars you got 130 dollars back in 4 days yeah. right so that's 230 dollars now normally you multiply the number of zeros the rich are making crazy money and the poor guy is stuck and the retail investor doesn't know what to do so one of our missions is to democratize financial inclusion financial mm -hmm. awareness ability to make that extra profit right what i would call the alpha why is alpha belong to the rich why should alpha not belong to the guy who has 100 dollars so we mm -hmm. bought our ipo product and this very nice customer wrote me a mail he rides a rickshaw right i don't know how many of you know a rickshaw but a rickshaw is manual uh, manual labor so this guy rides a rickshaw and he has two daughters and he's based out of indore and he uh, loves paytm so he's been always following paytm products for 5 6 years so everything we give he consumes right and he he just he invested in an ipo because we wrote our ipo document in hindi which nobody does just to give you an example that document somehow he's read it's a seven page document explaining why he or she should invest in a specific stock and he went ahead applied for the ipo because it was two clicks uh, the ipo was oversubscribed some thousand times he got lucky it's a lucky draw system mm -hmm. he got lucky he understood that he has to sell and he followed a tweet uh, and you know i don't know how he's following tweet but he is because i think his daughter's helped him out he followed a tweet and in one of the tweets one customer had asked me hey what to do and i because i'm not allowed regulatory i written hey if you want to book profits on listing this is the returns somehow this guy has followed all that and he listed and he made 7000 rupees which is 100 dollars right mm -hmm. he wrote back to me saying hey you know what my education problems of covid for my daughters is paid thank you for writing the document in hindi <laughs> i think and and you know uh, i think that's the change because technology product great companies will bring in that and we are not the only ones doing it i think there are a million other people like upasna like dilip bringing that to the masses i think that's what's going to change at least for india i don't know about the others yeah well, that's great that's good that's what business should be doing to democratize healthcare finance other sectors of the economy yeah absolutely other questions from the audience you can either put it in the chat room or you can raise your hand or you can even unmute yourself and just speak up well maybe i'll ask you a question this is not necessarily in the sectors that the three of you work in but one of the big pushes in india in the last few years has been that india should become more of a manufacturing country because you know i think some of you mentioned about job creation that for india to progress jobs have to be created and it's very likely that the jobs will be in the manufacturing sector rather than the service sector and especially manufacturing for exports and there was this big push on make in india and to be able to export more how do you think that's working is that working out well or what more needs to be done uh because that's where a lot of the less educated workers will end up working is in the manufacturing sector if i could go uh, there anil uh, yeah. one of course is uh, uh, 
for manufacturing to be a significant proportion of the gdp it is uh, a, a journey i think currently services form the overwhelming segment right. of the gdp and manufacturing for the reason that you mentioned that you know job creation especially for the uh, less educated or semi skilled people i think workforce i think that is that's an important avenue and make in india possibly had that uh, objective in mind i think uh, uh, government has done a lot of work the the the, the first thing that they needed to do was to uh, make uh, it easier to set up a business i think that's where india has progressed uh, in the last uh, uh, last few years i think compared to a few decades ago or couple of decades ago the ability to set up a business is is quicker in the sense the the uh, the steps involved the approval process involved uh, those things are, are, are quicker i think affordability of credit i think that would be the the, the second issue i think banks are being cautious given the npa the non performing asset uh, you know issue that many of them would have i think what is required parallelly along with the government policy would be a, a liberal credit policy i think that's where uh, there is a bit of a dichotomy i think banks would have to open up the the central bank will have to work with the banks to the uh, to allow them to take this risk maybe categorize in there would doubtless be npas non performing accounts would be there maybe allowing them to categorize some of some of these startup for make in india or similar initiatives a little differently uh, could be one way i think liberalizing credit uh, and making market accessible i think those two things would be determining the success of that initiative and into my mind yeah. i think setting up uh, is becoming easier i think working capital you know the the the, the infrastructure funding working capital and market access i think we got more work to do uh, i'll defer to varun and upasana but uh, that's that's my right. no, that's a good answer varun or upasana do you have anything to say add to that I don't have too much information on this but i do so, love make in india yeah uh, so so anil i used to work for oppo before right and uh, oppo is one of the you know it's right. a, it's a very interesting sector uh, india is the world's third largest phone market uh, we do about 200 million uh, phone sales a year out of them 99% are imported uh, and it's a great sector the government has been working to bring make in india right so it's one of the sectors i used to work there i, I and we had a 100 acre manufacturing plant in noida just to give you a feeling we manufactured about my ex company used to manufacture about 100 million phones a year from there um and 100 million phones here is a lot right and it's one plus oppo realme vivo all the four are manufactured in the same place now when we were working there we were in this ministerial meeting and i went as an assistant to uh, you know to a guy because he said varun come along i had nothing else to do that day so i just sat there and i took notes and very interesting because it was a make in india meeting which the uh, government was chairing right so i i got to understand there the phone manufacturer's point of view and it's very simple they said hey is india great to manufacture yes because is abundant of land talent and so to speak everything what's missing uh, and the mobile companies asked for three things they said hey can we have indians who are actually engineers but they are actually taught engineering in college right uh, you know it's a very it's a very uh, it's a pun but yeah indian educationists and indian graduates are actually not educated so well so they're not skilled and if they're skilled they're skilled for the wrong things so actually when a company takes them in you have to actually retrain them all over again which is another two year journey to make for everybody right so there's this whole skill element of practicality which we said the second thing which we said was infrastructure and the simplest thing we asked was we need a road i'll give you an example we were trying to set up a manufacturing plant in tripura because from there you could address bangladesh thailand indonesia malaysia etc single biggest problem was we needed a road to the port right so you need a road where trucks can go at 120 km per hour without having everybody else jumping in the way now the government said yeah we'll do it but we'll take 7 years to do it right and uh, i think those are the that was the second th- second need and the third was very simple saying hey please allow us to do our job without interference right you know uh, allow us to do what we are meant to do which is to manufacture uh, don't ask us to manage politics don't ask us to manage right. pr don't ask us to yeah. manage the farmer around the corner right Yeah. and and i think those three things india has done a fantastic job in the last 3 years uh, dilip beautifully put it it's a journey we are yeah. on it i think we've taken two steps forward another 10 years yeah. i suspect it will be a big manufacturing hub that's correct uh, i've seen there's somebody audience with a hand up uh, warren 
Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I just wanted uh, to know if any of the panelists are willing to share their contact information with us as a uh, volunteer at the beginning of the panel discussion. Yes, uh, Janvi has got uh, my, my contact details for sure. So I would leave it to Janvi to do the need. Yeah. Um, sorry. I'll send mine to you as well. Yeah. Um, like I said, um, you know, if you feel I have the information, so all the attendees can, um, yeah, I can put that in the chat so you guys have access to it. Um, That's correct. I have two Thank questions you. in and the I actual chat. Um, yeah, I think Varun um, just put his in there, so feel free to use that. And I think we have a few more questions in the chat. Yeah, so. let me, I think that's good, John. I'll bring up a question that's in the chat room. It says, there's a participant saying, I'm pursuing data science specialty in the sector of healthcare. How do you see big data in healthcare to analyze the criticality in the years from now in India? So basically, how is how is the healthcare sector using big data to improve the quality and access to healthcare? And uh, if do you want to start I, us off? I, yeah, if I could go, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the question was from Yamini. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, my input to her is India has uh, just about starting that journey uh, would be my answer in the sense the, the data available is phenomenal that, you know, whether it is epidemiological data, uh, issues related to diagnosis, the test results, I think enormous data is available. But I think most of us, at least I can speak for my company, Manipal Hospitals, we, we actually see about uh, 6 million patients in a an year and uh, we would have data for the last 20 years. So that is enormous quantum of data. But I don't think uh, we have figured out or we are actually prioritized using that for anything, uh, anything uh, substantially changing the healthcare, uh, you know, architecture, anything changing the way we deliver healthcare. Part of the reason is the privacy loss in India is, 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 a, is a little tough that, you know, so we would have to keep that in mind, but even that allows the use of data. I think it's a matter of uh, we putting our mind to it, personally speaking. There are opportunities there. There are companies which are entering into India with this as an objective. There are companies from Israel, for example, who have made some early strides in this, reaching out to people like us for collaboration. I think COVID accelerated uh, you know, some of these. I think big data, in uh, particularly images, using images uh, to, to create AI tools to provide initial diagnosis especially in areas where qualified doctors are not available. I think the opportunities are tremendous. I think we would need some startups like Varun to really take it up in, 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 you know, uh, as a mission. Uh, I don't think it is healthcare delivery companies. Like I said, you know, this is not core to what we do. Uh, so therefore, we always take it up when we have some spare time. And there is never adequate spare time to do anything meaningful. Yeah. Uh, fresh minds, startups, and somebody who would focus on it. And there is, there'll be a lot of work to do. Yeah. Varun, do you want to add to that? Oh, Upasana, go ahead. Make, yeah, Upasana is speaking, so I'll let Upasana speak. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm in the insurance and TPA space, and we cover about 68 million lives with respect to healthcare and our network. Mm -hmm. And uh, this includes uh, the PMJY. But what we do is we actually recommend to the government what needs to be done and how to build their network and what we need to do. It's actually accelerated during the pandemic because the IRDA that governed us um, was asking for hard copies and all our data was in hard copies and, con and we were converting them slowly into soft copies. Now, because of the pandemic, it's uh, not become mandatory anymore. So that's why uh, we can keep soft copies and we can start telling the government because we, we are sitting on tons of data. And now we can uh, we do that to insurance companies, but we are also recommending to the government. The government is coming out with new schemes for the missing middle, and we are helping the government build the right insurance 
for the missing middle and enhance the programs. So we are giving information and we are using this data to create new programs in healthcare. Interesting, yeah. Go ahead, Warren, what are you gonna add to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I was just adding, uh, you know, I, I had a great chance to work once with uh, somebody called Sanjeev Mantri. Yamini, you should add him on LinkedIn. He's fairly active. If not, you write me a message and I'll connect you. Uh, he's the uh, kind of number two for ICICI Lombard. It's India's largest private insurer. And they have a whole data science team working on figuring out how to make health insurance policies personalized. Uh, because if I go to gym every day, if I run five kilometers, I cycle, or I live in Bombay versus Goa, uh, you know, for sure my life is going to be up or down and so should my premium, right? And there, there's some fantastic work happening in the insurance companies. Like Upasna said, I don't know the medical fraternity. And just to tell you, uh, at Paytm, we bought a company very recently. It's called Raheja QB. So we just bought an insurance company. We're waiting in queue to get our certifications and our approvals. But one of the things we will do at Paytm is to bring in a lot of data science to uh, ask ourselves a very simple question saying, hey, why should somebody's health insurance premium be same when he or she leads a different lifestyle? Now, what wearables and IoT has done is completely changed the game of data. So the day somebody like Upasana or Dilip uh, you know, reaches out and actually does a partnership with a data analytics company and the regulations allow data to be mixed, we're going to see magic, right? And I think that day is fantastic. Uh, and Upasana spoke earlier about like India has done digital payments with UPI or unified payment interface. The day unified health happens in India, and it will, I think it's going to be a big, big revolution for everybody. So, yeah. So, a lot of work is happening, Yamini. I think, you know, please apply for jobs. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, let's see, we got only about two, three minutes left. Why don't we, uh, Janavi, let's have the audience do a networking if they like, just for the next few minutes, they can set up contacts. What do you think? Um, I think. It's better just to keep in time, um, you know, just to keep in mind the panelists' time. I think okay. maybe one or two more questions and then right. working stuff we can deal with later on with getting the contact information out. All right. So let me read one more question from one of the participants. Uh, let me see. There was one here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. It says, are free healthcare and free education practically possible? How would it impact the business sector in India? if we had free healthcare and free education. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah. Let me tell you that human beings don't value free things. We've done a lot of free uh, ca health camps or free surgeries, but you know, the minute they actually pay for it, they actually value it more. And I've seen that all over in all different aspects of um, different people in India, and I've seen it in different locations, that when they pay, even if they pay five rupees for a health check or something, they actually value it. So I don't think that uh, anything should be given free. And I think it'll just make people uh, lazy and not use it. So I think people should work for it and then they will see value. Anil, if I could add, you know, uh, I, I would say uh, free is from the perspective of the consumer, right? The person who asked about free uh, education right. or free healthcare is from the perspective of consumer. It is certainly paid by somebody else, maybe the government, maybe a, a insurance company, maybe right. a pool of others. So, uh, so therefore, uh, free for the consumer does not really mean that service delivery is free. And and the, in, if the business as a, if the business got a model like like if you look at uh, say an NHS in 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 the UK as an example, it may be free for the consumer. In the back end, if there is a model available where there is an, the investor can get a, a, a return, a reasonable return. But, and if there is a purpose for making it free for the consumer, whether that, that, that expenditure can, in, in some, other, some other manner, you know, maybe through an insurance, or maybe any, any of those pooling system can flow back to the, the provider, there still could be a model. But uh, I, I agree with the person that, you know, things which are, at least in the Indian context, said to be free uh, is, is viewed as sub-quality, sub-standard in mm -hmm. most of the time. But keeping that aside, you know, uh, the, the, the label free is only from the consumer's perspective. It is not really free for the delivery company is what I would say. That's true. Somebody has to pay for it. Could be That's the government, true. the taxpayer, or the insurance NGO. company, or, you know, or, a, or, a, or a, a, a pooling system. But, you know, yeah. it, it is free basically a misnomer I mean, is what I would Right. Yeah, it's just free to the consumer. That's, true. That's right. 
Anil, can I have a slightly different point of view just for the fun of it? Yeah. Yeah. Who's this speaking? Varun. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I would love, you know, till I was in India and I didn't leave India to go to Egypt and then from there to Paris, I honestly didn't value life. Uh, you know, the first time I arrived in France uh, and I lived then with French people for about eight years with Europeans in general, mm. I understood the value of life and I must confess that, right? Then when I came back to India, I'm very happy to see youngsters valuing life now in India. But in general, the value of life, I think the meaning of it, the benchmark is different. Mm. Uh, I would love in India for the rich to pay taxes so that bottom 300 million actually have any hospital care for the rest of their life for free, right? And I understand then it's a question of delivering quality, who pays the bills. But, you know, I, I think there has to be a day when we start valuing the bottom of the pyramid because, and, and in a proper way. So, you know, it's a consumer request, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not a business request at all. I don't speak as, I speak as one of the non-panelists who would say, hey, uh, you know, I would love that one day 300 million Indians at the bottom of the pyramid properly established. Actually, we tell them, hey, after you're born, next 75 years, fall sick, don't worry, we'll take care of you, right? And the rich get to pay the bills. I think that would be, it's almost something that I would do if I was prime minister, but you know, neither am I. So I'm allowed to pass this free non-committal comment on an <laughs> industry that I don't manage. Right? But Varun, so, it is happening. Our government scheme is making it happen. So it is exactly. happening. Yeah, exactly. I, I, would I, I would only say, Varun, you are in Goa and uh, ours is the largest hospital in Goa. So if you require anything there, please don't go there if you are not going to pay. Is what I <laughs> I, I, I pay taxes and I pay more. Don't worry. So, <laughs> that's, so Varun, if you run for prime minister, I'll vote for you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Thank you to the three wonderful panelists. Thank you. Varun, Dilip and Upasana. You, we loved hearing you. You clearly are very knowledgeable about your own business, about India. And the audience benefited tremendously from this. And thank you to all the audience for coming. Your questions. And you have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.